quick. As people are coming in from their as people are coming in from their breakout sessions and from break. How uh how did breakout sessions go? Pretty good? Pretty good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. good. Okay. Again, just a reminder, hold on to that brochure and go ahead and pick. I know in some sessions we had to kind of cap and kick people out, so get there early, reserve a seat so you uh, you can get the sessions you want to get, okay? What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us real quick and then introduce our guest speaker, and uh, we'll get going on some fabulous teaching. Go ahead and pray with me. Father, thank you for today, and God, thanks for the continuation of Spiritual Lessons this week. You know we're at different locations and we're experiencing different things. Thank you so much for worship this morning. God, thank you for our awesome staff and faculty that want to lead this, uh, lead where their hearts are at in their breakout session. And Father, thank you for our guest speaker. Uh, thanks that you've equipped men and women throughout the world to uh, bring forth the word of God in a way that's relevant, in a way that's accurate, and in a way that is practical. And so God, I pray that you would use Ryan and uh, the gifts you've given him to minister to us over the next four days. And just allow us to be eager to uh, open the word of God and hear the word of God. And Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would um, just invade our lives in a way that we get something out of this. And that we walk away with, uh, with lots of takeaways. So we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, for those of you that were with us last year... Um, we had uh, a special guest speaker, Ryan Gard. Ryan comes from Mission Community Church, and Mission's on the east side of town. Ryan's been there for a little while. He has a wife, three children, and more importantly, though, I think Ryan just displays what we try to get out of all of us, which is a consistent and a faithful walk with the Lord. And what I love about Ryan is he's not... Uh, too high up to admit, hey, here's some of my failures. Here's some of the things that God had to redirect me. And I think those of us that were here last year heard a lot of that from Ryan. And, and it was just powerful because I think what resonated with all of us was, hey, I can relate to this guy. Uh, this isn't a guy that's coming in on his high horse and preaching down. But Ryan preaches across the table. And I think that that's why we, uh, we got together and said, hey, can we get him back? And Ryan uh, graciously accepted our offer and our invitation. And so without any further ado, would you welcome up, please, Ryan Garth. Yeah. Luke 5, if you have a Bible. We have an hour together. <laughs> what are we going to do? Hi, how are you? I know you. Who else do I know? Do I, no, don't lie to me. I know you. Uh, I know the Good Dow crew. I don't know you. I do know you. I do know you. Fantastic. Hi, you're taking my picture. Elbow out. Uh, nice to meet you. It's gonna have some fun in here. I hope. How's the basketball team doing? Can we shoot some hoops? Sorry, uh, squirrel. Uh, so Luke 5, we're gonna be in there in just a minute. Just so... You know a little bit about me. You already know I got some babies. I have a little girl. She's two months. Uh, I don't have a picture of her. I have her on my phone here. Uh, so if you really want to see, I have a wife. You cannot see a picture of her unless you're a girl. Otherwise, it's a stumbling block. It's not fair. Um, she's hot. Uh, and I have two boys that right now I, uh, I really want to like, but they're three and four years old. So I'm really happy to be here with you. Uh, they are so hard. Harder than teenagers, so uh, I love them. They're Griffin and Gavin, and they're incredible. So anyways, that's, that's me. Um, I'm trying to figure out how, who's a freshman? Yeah. Are you all over here? Is that how you do it? Who's a sophomore? La 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 la. Oh, okay. Who's a junior? <laughs> Peppy. And seniors, seniors over here. Some of y'all look like you know, you're 30. You guys are like grown up. I know you. So the seniors are like, put the juniors between us and the freshmen. That's a lot of freshmen. You're all freshmen right here? Who? Wait, where's your hand? Where's the, where's the line? Where's the, uh, no feedback, no feedback. Huh? Oh, right here. Just seeing who I got. Freshmen. How, who's, are you, is anyone 13? Oh, so cute. 
Okay. I love it. All right, seniors, is anyone, is anyone 19? Is anyone 19 yet? 23. Uh. <laughs> You're gonna make it, eventually. No, 18, 18, 18, 18, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, so we have 13 year olds and people who are old enough to go into the military in the same room, this is fantastic, okay. I'm 36, so I'm twice your age. Uh, that's awesome. I don't know if you would have guessed that. I don't know why I'm saying all this, but when I was your age, I stunk at life. I was terrible, terrible at this human being thing, and last year you heard some of that. I just want to set the bar real, real, real low for me uh, so that you feel like you can come with me for a week. I, I don't want to share anything grotesque or gross, but I want you to understand that I didn't earn this microphone by any means. I never thought this would ever happen. I've sat in your sort of seat before. I went to an FCA thing when I was in high school, and I looked at this clown on the microphone, and I just thought, this dude's such a troll, such a tool. All these words are popping in my head that I can't say. And I just thought, this whole religion thing is such a sham. I had nothing to do with it. I wanted nothing to do with it. Um, and, and I was such a terrible human being. I, High school was super difficult for me because of me. The hardest year was my second senior year. I, uh, I just absolutely could not get it right. Freshmen are like, wait, there's only one. Uh, yeah, I, I just bombed high school, tried to fail it. They eventually gave me a piece of paper that said I was done. Uh, I got arrested multiple, multiple, multiple times for stupid, 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 painful things. Uh, and all that to say, I went into my 21st year of life mostly drunk. Um, just went down to Mill Avenue or Scottsdale Road every single night. And I want you to just hear just a little bit before we get going. I went to the clubs, one of the clubs, not to dance, because uh, that ain't in me, uh, but we were somewhere where music was playing and there were girls there, so that's all I needed. Uh, and so I was there and we were just drinking and we crashed our car on the way home. My brother and I, he rented a Ford something. And uh, we crashed that thing in some backyards and pulled out of the poor people's backyard in the middle of the night, drove to our house and we're laughing about it all. And, um, it's the craziest scene, because I, I, I woke up the next morning. What had happened was we got home at like two or three in the morning. Uh, my brother and I were sleeping at my cousin's house. They were older than us, they let us come. And last year, some of you heard this story. Uh, I, I fell asleep out front of their house, because my brother went around to the back to let me in, because we didn't have keys, we forgot. And he forgot about me out front, and I forgot about him in the back. And so at about three in the morning, I just fell asleep right there uh, on the porch passed out, uh, pathetic, just this sad person. And, and Sunday morning, my family, my cousins wake up. They're, they're 10 years older than I am. They got two little boys, and they, they see me sleeping on their welcome mat, which is the biggest metaphor ever. Like, they're letting me live there, and I'm sleeping half drunk on their welcome mat. And they're like, come on, sweetie, let's go to church. And they hop over me, and they drive to Cornerstone. Uh, and so, uh, all right, um, and uh, the next weekend, though, they plotted and planned all week. They said, hey, we've got to, this is our moment. We've been praying for this idiot for five years. Let's ask him if he wants to go to church. So I did the same thing I did the weekend before, minus the crash. Woke up that morning, had, you know, my tank top on and, and basketball shorts and wiping Saturday night out of my eyes. And um, my cousin, Nicole, this hero, she looked at me. She's terrified of things. I'm destructive. And she says, hey, Ryan, um, I'm just trying to get some water or some juice or something. Do you want to go to church with us? <laughs> you know, like super scared, shaking like smalls and no, squints. Um, scared out of my mind. And I'm like, no, that's your thing. You go. You do your thing. And uh, she's like, oh, she had a backup plan in case I said no. She walked in with a backup plan. She said to this loser who had very little money, and he's 21 and he's basically freeloading. So she goes, if you go, we'll, um, we'll buy you lunch. I was like, all right, let me put on a shirt. And I went in and put a shirt on and went to this little church plant called Cornerstone. And I got really curious, mostly about the girls there. I was, again, real low bar. Um, but I stuck around long enough to question the whole thing, tried to prove this whole thing wrong. I hated it. I didn't want religion to be true because it was so ugly. It was so ugly. Everything I'd seen about religion was so ugly. It was only wars and it was only rivalries and it was always agendas and it was always so fake. And I was like, I want... Why would I want anything to do with that? Uh, I'll fast forward the story, although we have a lot of time. I'll fast forward the story. Get comfy. Um, I'll fast forward the story. 
fast forward and just tell you that year, I went from being a complete, total atheist, I'm not interested whatsoever, to oh, your camera on me, I'm gonna hold still for you, buddy. He's like, come on, bro, you're wearing me out. <laughs> to a year later, I surrendered to the reality and the truth that I was convinced this is actually all true. So at 21 years old, after living an incredibly destructive lifestyle, I surrendered, that was the word. I was convinced it was true, and so I surrendered. I said, fine, go be a Christian. That was the worst, that felt like so bad. And so I ended up going to this retreat at a place called Forest Home, an uh, incredible place in Southern California. College retreat, these people were there listening to sermons and stuff. And that's where, for me, it went from here to here, I guess you could say. It went from this, I believe it's true, to like, I want to give my entire life to this. I want to give everything I am to this. I want to follow Jesus anywhere. And then I, I had this, you know, um, freak out. I, I, I had this uh, camp high. It was a different kind of high than I was used to. I was on all of a sudden this, like, I was on a table. I found myself all of a sudden, like, on a table, standing on a table in this room after the sermon, and we were breaking out, and I'm like, I don't know what's happening to me, you know? And everyone's like, we don't either. What's wrong with you? And I'm like, everything's changing. I don't know what's happening. I actually believe this crazy message. And I left that place, and everyone's like, Ryan, you're on a camp high. It's going to go away. It just hasn't. It just hasn't. Since 2001, uh, it just, I, I can't get over the fact that this is true. Uh, I can't make sense of some things that have happened in my life, but I'll t just tell you, as we dive into Luke 5, my life doesn't make any sense. It never's really made any sense. The things that I've been through haven't made any sense. Losing my dad my junior year didn't make any sense. My parents divorcing didn't make any sense. All this trouble and frustration that's come my way, some I've created and some that's come, doesn't make any sense. Now I'm a professional Christian. <laughs> I'm a pastor. And still, my life rarely makes sense. The things that happen, the things that I see, they just don't make sense. And you're going to see in Luke chapter 5 this crazy story. What a transition. And I want to talk this week about my boy Peter. I talked about him a little bit last year. We won't talk about those same things. You've got to love this man, Cephas. Peter, he was a fisherman. A fisherman. So picture this big, hairy fisherman 2,000 years ago, out on a boat all night, coming in, smelling like salmon, and, and this is the man. This is the man. He's probably about your age. I'm guessing he's a little bit older, maybe, but he's just doing his thing, and here comes this Jesus. You've read this story before. Maybe it hasn't stuck out to you the way it sticks out to me, but it's this incredibly weird scenario where you've got a guy fishing, and Jesus rolls up in his 30th year of life. He's about to start his, what we'd call his public ministry. All right, maybe he was doing some Bible studies or hanging out, had some close friends, I don't know. But for 30 years, we don't get to see much of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, bam, he plants a church, like this roving church. He gets this small group of guys and some women that follow along and watch him. But this is how it happens for Peter, one of the ways in which it unfolds for Peter. All right, Luke chapter 5, I'm using the ESV. I don't usually rock this, so there's nothing highlighted, so we'll have to have some fun here. On one occasion, Luke 5, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of, I'm going to say it wrong, and he saw two boats by the lake. Two, you got that. He saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. You follow him? So the verse three, watch. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, that's Peter, Cephas, he's got all sorts of names, Simon Peter. He asked him to put out a little from the land, so kick off and go out. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. He gets in the boat, and he's like, hey, can I get in your boat? Well, you're already in the boat. They've been fishing all night. Jesus gets in the boat, and he says, hey, I know you're cleaning up. And so they have these massive nets. Like, imagine a net from here to the speaker and all the way to the wall, potentially, that they would throw out all night catching fish. Peter is a fisherman. Jesus is some random guy that just got in his boat. Super awkward. I'm just going to roll in. And here, here's Peter who's probably discouraged, probably tired from the night. And here he comes. He sees a couple of boats, gets right into them, and he asks him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Go to verse 4. When he finished speaking, so he stood on the boat and did this. He knew the acoustics on the water would be great. So Jesus gets out onto the water. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into, not just the, the, the shallow, but the deep 
and let down your nets for a catch. So he's going, dude, I know you've been doing this all night. He actually doesn't give this explanation. I know you've been fishing all night. I know it takes hours to clean the nets that you fish with all night. And I know we usually don't do this, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to go out into the deep water. I know you're tired. I know you're done. But I know it doesn't make any sense. He doesn't actually explain all of that. He says, go out into the deep. And this doesn't make any sense for him because Peter's a fisherman and he understands that that's not where the fish are. Maybe you don't know that. Anyone ever fish? Y'all fish? You like a bobber? How many of y'all bobber fishers? That's your, how you roll. Some of you upgrade, got the lure. Some of you just dive into the water, try to grab whatever you see. You're entertaining. Jesus goes, I want you to go, look, I want you to put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. The problem is that's not where the fish are supposed to be. He understands that this is not, this is not right. The fish are up and they school up tight at night because you can't see them. And so Peter here has this random guy. We don't know how much he knows about Jesus necessarily. They probably met once before. One gospel seems to make it clear. But he asks him to do something that doesn't make any sense. You don't go out into the deep at that time. That's not where they are. They're going to school up. And we're done, dude. We're done. We're done. But Peter, instead of whining about it or you know, complaining, he does what every single parent wishes their kids would do. And Simon answered, Master, yes, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when he had said this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. Their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. So somehow Peter goes, all right, hey, before this guy even asks, I'm going to say yes. That's kind of an interesting scenario. Hey, I want you to drop your nets in this weird spot, uh, and here's just going to work out promise. He drops the nets, and here comes so many fish that it actually begins to just break, verses 6 and 7. Imagine, you've got to be in the boat. You've got to imagine what it's like to be out in the deep water in the middle of the night, and you've got such a pull on the nets that you're going down. Like, I put myself in this boat, and I just wonder, like, what was he thinking why did I listen to this guy? Why did I trust this guy? This was a terrible idea. Why would he ask me to do something that would put me in danger? Why did I ever trust him? Does he even know what he's doing? I'm a fisherman. You're a carpenter. Go make a chair. Why are you in my boat making it sink? What are you doing? This was a horrible idea. If you're like at least 13, and you've been following Jesus for a while. I guarantee if you're 18, you've asked that question. You've been in some situation, and if you haven't asked the question yet, what are you doing? Why are you letting this happen? Then I wonder how often you're putting yourself out into situations that are scary. I wonder how dependent you are on Jesus if you've never been scared of what he's allowing in your life and calling you to. And this doesn't make any sense to this rabbi, man. He hops in the boat, and they freak out. And watch, I just want to finish the story with you. But then when Simon Peter saw it, he, oh, I'm sorry, they signaled to their partners. Go back to verse 7. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Verse 9, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. I'm trying to process this story. It's so weird. Why mess with him? Why put him in a situation that you know things are going to go south? He puts them out on the water and they both almost sink. But then Peter, right away, I mean, he gets it right. Peter rarely gets it right, but sometimes he does. And in this moment, he goes, oh, away from me, get away from me, get away from me. And then he calls him Lord, for I am a sinful man. They're out on the boat, and it's dark outside, and he's life in the darkness, because all of a sudden, now he realizes, I'm in the presence of holiness. And he's not afraid of his life anymore. He's not worried about the fish or the, or the boats. He's worried about his soul. And I, I look at the scene with Peter, and he just knows who he is, and he realizes who Jesus is, and he says, you need to get out of here. You need to go. You need to go. You need to get out of my presence. Why? 
Peter goes, because I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. You don't want anything to do with me. I love Peter's honesty. He's like, I don't think you want anything to do with me. And he has the same response that some of you have heard of Isaiah the prophet. He, he gets a glimpse. And this is a super famous passage in chapter 6. And when she gets a glimpse of the glory of God, we don't flip there, but it's this scene where he goes, uh, I see angels. And he's not on acid. He gets a glimpse into the heavenly realms, right? He's not tripping. He just sees some angels doing some pretty sweet angelic things, uh, flapping some wings, hiding their eyes, covering their feet in the presence of God, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And, and Isaiah, as soon as he feels the presence of God in that moment, he has the same reaction as Peter. He realizes how holy he is and how terrible he is, how holy God is. And then he's like, I suck. I am, there you go, I freshman. I, 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 I am wretched and dirty and filthy. And so Peter, in this moment, goes, you need to get out of the boat. So the Bible always contrasts this, this idea of evil and purity with darkness and light. Jesus calls him right into the darkness, shows up and does a miracle. But Peter goes, no, 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 no. And he wants Jesus to go away because just like me and just like you, we prefer and lean into the darkness. But actually, the gospel writer John, chapter 319, says that men love darkness because light exposes their flaws and their sins. So Peter feels unworthy. You ever been there? You feel like the ship's going down, and maybe I deserve it. I'm in the presence of something beautiful, but I'm not going to engage you in any other way. But you've got to give it to Peter in this moment. At least he had this sense of awe. And the sense of wonder, the sense of woe with God. I mean, he's got Jesus. He hasn't fully figured out who he is. He eventually one day will. But he's looking at him going, I don't, I don't, I don't think you should be anywhere near me. I, I need to push you away. Go to verse 10, and we'll see how Jesus responds. It says, and so were James and John, sons of Debedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. Sounds like something clever that you'd say to a lady. But he says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Don't be afraid. I'm not here to smite you. I got one message. I'll be with you four times. I have one thing to say. It's the same thing that Peter just realized. That despite his failure, despite his, his away from me, away from me, away from me, this pure and pure, 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 Pure. Can anyone raise a hand and go, I'm totally pure. Perfect. Some of you are all like, she's perfect. No, she's a mess. Right? She will notice me one day. Stalker. Despite, I mean, Peter gets it right. He knows himself. He knows his brokenness. And he says, you got to get out of the boat. Jesus could have got out of the boat and done a little surfing right there. Just could walk right on out. But he goes, no, I'm stay. Relax. Don't be afraid. I'm not here to smite you. Don't be afraid. And Jesus comes in and he interrupts this scene. He changes their plans. He asks them to do something incredibly awkward, frustrating. It doesn't make any sense. It's not rational. And they're open to it. They're open to it. He asks them to do something ridiculous. I want to hook a left. Peter knew this story. I want you to go to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5, tap Josh 5 on your phone, if that's how you're rolling. Joshua chapter 5, this is how God acts. He's just frustrating sometimes. I love him. But sometimes, and I think Peter knew this, he's going to ask us to do things that sound crazy, if you're listening. He's going to ask you to do some things that sound crazy if you're open. I just sat with a kid yesterday. He didn't know me, and... Uh, I, I got to be careful what I say because there's a connection here. I sat with a kid that's 16. He's got all sorts of things going for him. Handsome kid, super funny, athletic, all that. And I walked through with him for like an hour and a half every reason why I believe in God, like why I've given my life to this, and I didn't check my intellect at the door. And I walked through what I felt like was a pretty compelling argument for the existence of God and the love of God for us. And it, he sat there the whole time politely going, mm-hmm, 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 yeah, oh, mm-hmm. And at the 
very end, because I'm a very impatient man, I looked and I was like, why are we here? Why, what, what are you doing? And I asked him a question. I said, are you even open to this? And he goes, nope. Oh, like, that would have been great 90 minutes ago. That would have been great. And I'm like, dude, all I laid out was something that made pretty rational, reasonable sense. And he's like, yeah, I'm good. I'm like, what are you into? And he listed off all these things that I went, dude, you're so boring. I said, dude, listen, I'm just gonna pause for a moment. I love this kid. I was like, dude, here's what I said to him. He's getting into all these things that your mom and dad don't want you to get into. He's getting into all these things. I mean, he's been hooking up, and he's been smoking, he's been drinking, he's been doing all sorts of things. And, 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 and I'm like, sir, you're boring. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, you're trying to be a rebel, but you're doing what everyone else is doing. That's not rebellion, that's conformity. You're just doing what everyone expects you to do. You said, I'm, I'm not stepping into mystery, I'm not stepping into beauty, I'm not stepping towards maybe something bigger. You're, you're settling for a typical high school experience. Gosh, that sucks. I just looked and I was like, buddy, I want something so much better for you. But he wasn't even open to it. And I think if you look through scripture, God consistently is just wondering, are you open or are you closed? I don't want to represent a new idea. I'm going to tie it in. The people that Moses walked around with were open, closed, open, closed, open, closed, open, closed, open, closed, open, closed, over and over and over again. It was like, Hosanna. Let's get high. Like, it's just unbelievable. Like, that wasn't in my notes, but they, <laughs> stupid. They were. And you, you just thank God we're done with that, right? We would never, ever act like that. Um, totally behind us as a humanity species. Moses walked around, did you know this, in the desert, so y'all can feel his pain, for 40 years. I think that's how long the Lord has me in the desert as well. I got four to go. Uh, for 40 years, Moses walks around. He's got some miracles. He saw a, uh, a bush talk. There was a talking bush. Again, no peyote, no shrooms, no acid, no ecstasy, no weed. No, 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 no. None of that. Just God speaking in a bush. Exodus 3. God goes, hey. Huh? Uh huh? Is that you? Take off your shoes. Okay takes off his shoes in the presence of God, has this really rad moment with him, gets a stick that does some incredible things, has a sea do the splits for him, and he walks through. But he, over and over and over again, is leading people who refuse to trust that God's ways are best. They're the most stubborn, whiny, grumbling People that have ever existed and Moses walked around for for 40 years with them for 40 years and Joshua look at Joshua chapter 5 was Moses's aid he was his assistant he was his right-hand man in many ways you could say and Joshua got to see follow me he got to see firsthand what happens when men and women who are following God refuse to trust God's ways are best Peter, as he's asked to push out on the boat, probably wondered about this story. I'm just guessing, or he reflected at one point on it. In Joshua chapter 5, uh, two chapters ago, they've sent spies into this land. They're trying to conquer this land. These are some enemies that just got to get out of the way. There's a lot of history there, but they're essentially trying to take over this spot. You're going to see in Joshua chapter 5, go to verse, let's skip up to verse 13. They're outside of Jericho. Jericho's fortified. You can't get in there, all right? Unless you know someone or you live somewhere in there, all right? So they, they're trying to get in there. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. It says this. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he rolls up in the desert, sees a guy with a sword. Joshua's like, hey, buddy, he's solo. I got crew. 
Are you, are you for us or are you for our enemies? I love it. It's a good question. It's a fair question. Hey, buddy, are you on my side or the bad side? And he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? So weirdest scene. He rolls up to a guy and he goes, are you, are you for me or are you against us? What's, what's your deal? He goes, neither. It wasn't an ABC question. I asked again, are you for us or for our enemies? No. Right? And he goes, but I'm the commander of the Lord's army. And Joshua's like, shoes off, face down. Hosanna. I don't know why I keep picking that song. Hosanna, Hosanna. He starts worshiping. Starts worshiping. Whose team are you on? He's like, mine. Mine. Okay. Not, not, not your team. Mine. So funny. He said, no, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell, like it says. He goes, what do you, what do you require? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Huh. Some of you are young. You haven't had to walk through a situation in which you can look back on a scene and go, I should have trusted, fill in the blank, my parents. I should have trusted my friends. I should have trusted the wise counsel. I should have trusted God. But he has, because he's been in a situation where he watched his people refuse to trust God. And he remembered that God one day went to his boss, Moses, and goes, hey, take off your shoes. I got something for you. And then he got to watch as this man, for 40 years, gave his life to the cause of God. And then when he's about to enter what's called the promised land, what he'd hoped for his whole life, he died. God has a wonderful plan for your life, kids. It's to wander in the desert for 40 years, and before you retire, die. It's in the Bible. It's right there. It's Moses. You don't see that in the coloring books. You don't see him just laying face down right outside of the Rainbow Palace. Food is good. <laughs> Whatever. No, you see a man who trusted God, even when it didn't make sense, but then fell short and served the people with him. And here comes this boy. He's got a second chance. He's got a second chance. He's seen his people fail, and he refuses to. So it gets a little crazy. Verse 1, chapter 6. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. So they got the doors locked so the Israelites don't get in. None went out and none came in. The Lord said to Joshua, this is so funny, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. Huh? God goes, look, I've given them to you. He's like, uh, it's shut up, meaning there's big walls, no one's coming out, and no one's going in, and God goes, look, it's yours. That's a creepy God, sorry. Hey, <laughs> want some candy? No, that's not a God I'm like. But he looks, look at another situation. If you're there, be in the story. He's got a history of watching God do incredibly confusing things. And now here he is, right in the middle of the scene, and he's going, no, that's a big wall. No, it's, it's, it's yours. I've handed them to you. No, you have not. But look at it. It's massive. We should have had like a freshman try to climb that wall. This would have been so fun to watch. Right? Right? Yeah, totally. You can do it. Like, this is easy. Hey, hey, God. Um, you've handed them to me, but the doors are locked. And this battle plan of yours, it's not working. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Okay. Okay, you've handed them to me. Uh, <laughs> who's a basketball player? Anybody? Even if you don't play on the team. Um, or volleyball? <laughs> Football? Tennis? <laughs> Whoa. That was a reaction. 
uh, chess team, chess team in the house. Whoa, what? What, what? What did I miss? Golf. Soccer. Huh? Cross country? Uh. I hate sports. Uh. You're gonna hate this illustration. Have you ever been in a game with someone? My friend Chris is famous for this. He'll be in a game, and if, if someone's trash talking, this is what happens. They'll be in a scene where, where that you, 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 maybe you're, you're winning by 50, and, and then all of a sudden the guy that's losing will hit a sweet shot, and then he'll do, oh! And he'll walk with that ridiculous swagger that I can't do because I'm 36 and white, and I just I have none, I've got no sweetness in me. But, and then what do you say to that kid? Was that offensive? I got three more days, or you'll have a new teacher tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> he'll be great. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, so that kid that's bragging in that moment, what you want to say to him in that moment is, hey, scoreboard, you got me. Scoreboard, what does scoreboard mean? It's over, we're up by 50, you idiot. You can swagger it all the way up and down the court, but you're done. Get a hug from your dad. Stop trying to get your affirmation from us and our perception and opinion of you. I got baggage. I'm just thinking about this kid. Shush, the game's over. The problem with Joshua 5 is that God, as they walk up to the massive fortified walls, goes, scoreboard. What? We're down 50. That's a big wall. No, I've given them to you. Game's over. Okay, coach, what's the plan? And the worst coach ever speaks up. You would, if you were a coach, if you were a sergeant in the military, and this happened, you go, you're fired. Verse 3. Here's the, here's the plan. Here's what you'll do. You shall march around the city. Mm. All the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Huh, are we going to throw grenades? No. Seven priests. Oh, good. Priests. They'll help. Shall bear seven trumpets. Go oh, trumpets. Trumpets. Make some people want to die, but not actually kill them. Not you, not you, trumpet player. Not you, girl. You keep trumpeting, okay? So trumpets of ram's horns. So dead animals with horns. Good. They're here. I'm marching. Ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. Okay. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, not an okay shout. Make it great. And the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go out every... What? We're going to march? The marching? You're sending the marching band in with the, the priests? And it's going to fall down flat. People shall go up. Everyone straight before him. And they did it. It's the worst plan ever. Like, have you ever heard of a worse plan? All right, team, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to march around our enemies. No catapults. I'm not sending any freshmen in. <laughs> I'm in. I'm dead. Like, God, it's in the Bible. The battle plan. Hey, coach, what's the plan? We're going to walk. To where the uh, where the weapons are? No. To get closer to shoot our weapon? No. Okay. You're gonna march, and they did it. They did it. The biggest bunch of whiners that have ever lived did not utter one complaint. They didn't grumble one single time. They just did it. They did it. Not one word, no whining, no complaining. They did it. They didn't go, but, 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 you know, 
don't understand, God. They just did it. Why? Because they've watched what happens when people refuse to trust God's way. When people refuse to believe even the craziest advice that God throws their way. They'd seen that happen. And so they just did what God said. They trusted his plan, and it sounded dumb. Didn't it? It sounded just dumb. And they conquered Jericho. But I don't think that day, listen, I don't think that day was about conquering Jericho. I think that day and that battle was about God conquering his own people. You don't like me to say those sorts of things, but if you're anything like me, you are your worst enemy. You think you got haters. High school is such a blip on the radar. It's over in a heartbeat. It's you. You'll stick with you. There's an enemy. And then there's you. And you sometimes are the greatest enemy you face. Because you'll start doing this. What I do is I will, I will sense or feel or, or be called to something like youth ministry. And go, no, man, I'm 36. I'm, I'm, I'm way too mature. <laughs> I'm just kidding on that one. I, I just, I, I, I can't do that. And I will tell myself a story to convince myself that what I think God's calling me to is not as good as what I can write up on my own. I'll, I'll start recreating this, like, God, 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 you just don't get it. It's 2015. I live in this situation. You don't understand relationships these days. You're up something, you're floating. You're just not floating it. I don't know where you are, but you don't understand it. And for the past 15 years, I think God's ultimate aim in my life has been to conquer me. I think he's doing the same with you. Because there's a way that seems right to a man. There's a way of fishing that seems right to a man. There's a way of battling that seems right to a man. There's a way of living that seems right to a man. There's a way of dating that seems right to a high school student. There's a way of being friends that seems right to a high school student. There's a way of using our money that seems right to an American, right? But in the end, sometimes the Bible's just going, you can go that way. I just think, as I read this story and I read about Peter on a boat, I wonder what he's trying to do in this room. If God's ultimate aim in this situation was to conquer them out of love, what's he trying to conquer in you? What is it that he's trying to get you to trust him that even though it sounds crazy, it's for your good? And you keep asking, God, are you on my team? Are, are you on my team? Are you on my side? Do you even love me? And he's made that absolutely clear at the cross. But maybe he's not wearing your jersey. Maybe he's not up there going, you can do it, sweetie. You can pass that math test. You can, you can conquer those feet. Maybe he's up there going, I'm inviting you into something that's going to sound really Crazy. You want to be on my team? God is my co-pilot. He's my co-pilot. Jesus is my homeboy. He's my homie. Really? Or you better get out of the seat and let him drive. But he drives crazy. He drives crazy. He's not your homie. If this is all true, and I totally believe it is, I think that God is trying to invite us into something scary, something adventurous, Something that's going to cost us a lot. Something that may cost you personally. It may, it may be terrifying. You might be afraid. It may cost you friends. It may cost you perception. It may cost you Twitter followers. I don't know what it's going to cost you, but maybe some of us are holding on to something so temporary, and he's going, hey, I'm inviting you into something that sounds ridiculous, but you don't understand, God. No, I do understand. But all of my friends are... My sexuality, you, this is such an old book. Seriously, you want to talk to me about my sexuality? This thing's at least 2,000 years old. You just, yeah, I know. It sounds, it sounds dumb. It just sounds crazy. Yeah, your plan sounds crazy. Everyone else does it a totally different way. I got this, I know. Whether it's in battle, pushing out on a boat, 
He's asking us to stop rationalizing everything. And trust his ways are best. It's so hard. So how open are you? Maybe some of you are just rocking. You're going out into deep waters and it's scary and you're, 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 thinking, you're thinking the ocean song right now, right? Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. I'll walk upon the water wherever you'll call me. And some of you are all like, you can call me to this beach right here where it's safe and I'm good. And I'll go to a Christian school. We got Christian banners and Christian barbers. What's up? You can't remember the last time you've done something that was scary. You can't remember the last time that God's called you to trust him, submit to him, even when it sounded dumb, just nuts. Instead of going absolutely countercultural, you're just sort of swimming with the, the sea of culture that's going this way because you don't stand out and nobody criticizes you. How boring. If this is true, then whatever he asks me to do, I'm going to do. If this is actually true, what I surrender to and what we're invited to surrender to is to stop trusting you and to trust him. That's such a basic message. Just pause for a moment. Just think of your life. Think of what you woke up today conforming to that you know he's got something better. How are you playing it safe? Are you missing out? Because you just have to have an answer, and everything has to make sense. I tell you, I'm sad and sorry for you. You just need to play it safe. And I'll ask you this question as we dig into Peter's life this week. What would it take for you to be as open as Peter? He's not some celestial being, this Peter. He's a man who was capable of stabbing you on one day, true story, and then was also capable of being terrified by a little girl the next. This is the same guy. And he was such a mess, and I love it. I can't wait to walk with him this week. But i got to ask, does it need to make sense for you? Does it need to make sense? So for me, a little, little bit, uh, I was really good at what I was doing. Uh, I, I really kind of mastered this art of, um, this art of living when I was 20. Uh, I felt like I was nailing it. I lived in Scottsdale, and uh, you know, 17 years ago, I was much less sweaty, and uh, I was actually doing really well. I had an incredible job. I was working at the Royal Palms Hotel. Uh, it's where the president stayed when he came into town. I was doing super well, and, um, and, and, and then I, I, I left it. I left it all to become an intern at a church. I was terrified. I was making good money. I was driving a pretty sweet car, and then this pastor came along, and he said, hey, would you consider helping our students out? And as a time, 21 years old, what do I have to offer? Nothing. I felt like, personally, I have no wisdom. I got nothing but a story. And I'm just telling you, I'm 15 years past that moment. And I had every single one of my friends, my boys, my boys, I had my, not my kids, my, my, my best friends that I'd grown up with since fifth grade. My tightest friend, we would take a bullet for each other. We nearly did several times. Scottsdale's rough. <laughs> like, ha, ha. God. Scottsdale slash Tempe border, so that makes sense. And every one of them looked at me. Every one of them. Except for two. But every other one of them looked at me and said, You're crazy. You're taking this religion thing too far. You're taking this whole belief thing way too far. One boy, one of my best friends ever, looked at me, and I showed up at this party where he was at just to, just to be cool, be kind, love my boys. And he looked at me, he's like, what are you doing here? What do you mean, what am I doing here? Ryan Gard. You're, well, be gone. Be gone? Yeah, go find God. Say goodbye to that man, Kyle. I haven't seen him since. One of my best friends ever. I miss him. He's not on Facebook. I have no idea what he's doing. But I had to walk away. And I'm going to hang out at this church with these college students who love Scrabble. <laughs> Scrabble. 
Scrabble. Scrabble. And Settlers of Catan. Y'all even know what that is? It's the nerdiest game ever. And now I love it. And Scrabble. So God can give you Scrabble love right now. That's my message. I, just, I had to walk away, but you know what it actually did? It cost me. It cost me. And now I have best friends who won't talk to me, and not only there, I have a mom and two brothers who want nothing to do with me just about because of this. That I would even consider becoming religious or a Christian. My mom and I are awkward now. I'm like, what? That's, that's your plan, Jesus? To jack up my friends and my family? I had no idea what I was saying yes to, but I would do it over again in a heartbeat. I love my mom. I love that woman. She doesn't want to talk to me. My brothers are creeped out by me. Now I'm the weird guy. I'm the weird. I am a little weird. It gets me speaking gigs. <laughs> but now I, I look back and I'm like, I would do it again. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Saying yes to Friday nights and Chandler at the Scrabble table didn't make any sense. Saying, saying, saying no to all the things that I loved, that some of you, you know you love them, and the culture loves them and so champions them. And you know God doesn't want your life anymore. And so maybe some things that you're doing, you know, I, I'm going to trust God. It doesn't make any sense, but I'm bailing on this. I'm done with this. It's the same story every day, I feel like, when I wake up. He's going to ask me to do something crazy. Just like Peter, who knew how to fish. When a guy who got into the boat acting like he knew how to fish told him to do something that sounded crazy, he said yes before he even asked, it seems like. So, Master, because you say so, we'll push out. What if God asked you to do something, and before he even asked, you'd already said yes? Let's have that kind of heart. I'm going to pray for you, and we'll have some more time this week together. So let's pray. God, the last thing I want to do is waste anyone's time, especially, especially these guys. There's so many people listening to this prayer and hopefully agreeing with this prayer. I, I can't imagine what you would do if, if we just simply trusted you. And before you even asked us to do anything, we said yes. Help us to learn from Peter. Help us to learn from Jericho and that crazy scene that your way is best even when it doesn't make any sense. Help us to breathe in a deep breath of trust even now as we leave this place and go to a few classes and go home to situations, to parents, to families, to friendships, to jobs, where it doesn't seem to make any sense why you have us there. I pray for these guys that they would be obedient and trust you and seek to please you in those situations, even if it just doesn't seem like you know what you're doing. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ryan. Two, two and a half hours, guys. We spent two and a half hours at, in church, really. I mean, it, it was fascinating. Thank you so much to Riley and Ryland. Thanks to our spiritual breakout groups. And thank you to Ryan Gard. Thank you so much for leading us. Okay, here's the deal. Um, you've got lunch now, okay? And then the bell will ring. And then you've got third hour, and then you've got fourth hour, okay? And then tomorrow, we'll reconvene in Barnes after fifth and sixth hour. We'll reconvene in Barnes at 10 o'clock, okay? All right, you're dismissed. Thank you. Hey, Mindev, you're staying afterwards.